Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. As usual, we have to wait a couple of seconds, like some seconds, to allow to all the participants to be inside the meeting. The number is growing very fast. We will expect from the registrations about 70 participants today, you know, no pressure. Oh, great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then, um, yeah, I think that more or less the number now is more stable. Uh, the people that is late will join us later. But again, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Tara Bazard. I'm the lead scientist of the Barcelona Das Regional Center that is hosting the activities of the WMO Sun and the Storm Warming Advisory and Assessment System here in the in Barcelona. And just some tips about the platform that we were using for the webinars to the today's webinar. As you may know, this is a Zoom platform. The difference from another normal Zoom meeting is that you cannot catch us directly. You have two channels of communication with us. That is the chat. It is in the bottom of your screen. And also another box that is called Q&A, meaning questions and answer box. And please type all your questions during the webinar in this Q&A box. And also, if you have any comment or you want to raise any problem during the webinar, please write us through the chat. We will take care of everything during the session. And today with me for sharing this nice webinar, it is Slodovan Nitschkovic, that is part of the regional steering group of the SDS was and also a well-known researcher in the community of the dust, of the mineral dust, and also a new chair. This is our new, uh, more more recent chair to this session. This is Santiago Gasso. He's an expert in satellites. He's coming from NASA, and today is in the States or another. Washington. Okay, and he will help me together with Michko to to take care of all your questions and comments during the the discussion session. And now I will pass the floor to Snova Nikolic, that is, will introduce our speaker. Then, Nitko, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I'm glad to announce uh, uh, today's speaker, this is Ina Tegen, heading the Department Modeling of Atmosphere Processes at Leibniz Institute uh, for Tropospheric Research in Leipzig, in Germany. Uh, she's also a professor at the Leipzig Institute for Meteorology at the University of Leipzig, and she specializes in numerical modeling of troposphere aerosol distributions and impacts uh, at regional and global scales. In particular, she has advanced uh, the field of model-based analysis of mineral dust aerosol, including its investigation, the control, on dust emission and transport, as well as the role of natural and anthropogenic dust on the Earth uh, radiation budget. This is just a short bio. I have to add a few more sentences concerning Ina. Uh, when I was starting in 1990s, uh, my modeling work on dream model, uh, Ina's work and publications, that time I didn't know Ina personally, she was very helpful to read uh, her research and methodology, how to start to build up the, the model that I decided to do. So, you know, thanks for uh, very good uh, concepts uh, that you introduced uh, in, in uh, dust modeling. You know, you can start then with your presentation. Um, thank you very much for this nice introduction, both Sara and uh, Nitschko. And I'm very glad uh, that I have the opportunity today um, to talk about uh, the dust research uh, that we are currently doing at the uh, uh, Tropos Institute. Uh, <clears throat> uh, many thanks to a lot of um, uh, co-workers at Tropos, not all from my department, but actually from all the departments of Tropos, where dust research um, is quite an um, important topic uh, that we are dealing from from different sides. Um, I don't think that I have to say much on um, the uh, motivation and interest in dust research in th with uh, this audience. I'm sure you're all aware of that, but nevertheless, let me just say very briefly, we are interested in dust because 
it is an important climate factor. It, um, it uh, mod modifies not only the radiation budget, but also uh, has uh, interactions with clouds in particular about um, um, <clears throat> enhancing uh, freezing processes. Um, but uh, beyond that, dust is also a health impacting factor. It impacts uh, visibility and thus uh, traffic safety, for example, or even ecosystems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, dust itself, particularly the dust emissions, are depending on uh, climate factors like uh, uh, drought, winds, and vegetation cover. So changes in climate would also change um, <clears throat> uh, dust emissions and dust concentration in the atmosphere. So uh, what does this have to do with uh, Tropos? So let me just first uh, say a few words on the Tropos Institute. The full name is Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research. It's located in Leipzig, Germany, formerly known as IFT. It is a member of the Leibniz Association. It's a kind of a science uh, uh, society with many institutes from different fields, sort of like Max Planck, only that we don't have so many Nobel Prize winners amongst us. Uh, the, the science is about 160, 170 employees with about 100 scientists. So we are sort of a mid, smaller to mid-size compared to other institutions, research institutions. Our mission is understanding uh, um, uh, uh, processes um, uh, in, <clears throat> Uh, in the troposphere, multi-phase processes in the troposphere, and we are focusing on aerosol and aerosol and cloud interaction research. Uh, the work is done in four different departments uh, dealing with atmospheric chemistry, um, experimental microphysics of aerosol and cloud in the atmosphere, atmospheric uh, modeling, which is what I'm heading, and uh, remote sensing, both ground-based remote sensing and satellite remote sensing. And we are uh, approaching uh, the topic of aerosol and aerosol cloud interaction uh, <clears throat> by means of um, modeling on one hand, but also by laboratory measurements of uh, aerosol properties um, and by a wide range of uh, field studies, both at uh, stations, uh, but also during uh, individual uh, field experiments on land or uh, by ship, uh, including um, atmospheric uh, profiling studies as indicated here on the sketch. Um, the topic of mineral dust became a focus topic uh, or an important topic for uh, the work at Tropos starting sort of in the year uh, 2006, uh, um, uh, in 2008 with the two Samum experiments, which was the first experiment where different groups of Tropos were, were dealing uh, with um, uh, dust um, uh, pro uh, properties from all uh, sides modeling um, the particle measurements and profiling. But since then, as you can see on the pictures here in the background, um, the uh, research focus has much widened, both uh, from the regional perspective, the modeling going from regional to global scales, and also of the right range of um, uh, laboratory studies that are being uh, contact, uh, conducted in this context. Uh, what I want to talk today is about, uh, first of all, about the dust modeling work, because that's uh, one, my, my field, that's where, where I'm coming from. Um, but then um, I'm also uh, got uh, some, uh, uh, a lot of information. I can only show very much uh, ex extract from that um, on the ground-based LIDAR measurements that uh, um, is done in the remote sensing department from the chemistry. I just want to say a few words on the dust risk project, which deals with dust and health and on the ice nucleating um, particle measurements from the um, cloud group from the um, aerosol cloud microphysics department. But let me start with the uh, dust modeling. Um, all of these uh, effects, going back to the slide uh, that I was showing before, uh, by looking at the impacts of dust, one of the approaches is um, to first look into dust uh, transport models uh, and using the dust transport model results to help with investigating these different types of effects. And um, thus transport model is at the same time also um, a, a big topic, for example, in uh, Barcelona and uh, SDS Wasnitschko was, was very much advancing uh, this field of uh, dust uh, forecast modeling. Um, uh, many dust models exist. Uh, we don't really deal with this dust forecast modeling, but I picked uh, just for a random day, this was last Monday, 10 uh, at uh, zero UTC, results from four different dust models that are uh, combined in the uh, AMET uh, website that uh, provides a daily dust forecast. And this is a 
thing that you see for any random um, um, day, if you, if you look at it, you often see similar features. Something that you see that the rough features of the dust forecasts are um, agree. Um, you find um, dust transport from the individual models, in particular the long range transport in this case to Europe um, is quite nicely matched both as a pattern as well as a magnitude. But if you go, go and look closer to the source areas of the dust, you do see uh, considerable differences. This is dust optical thickness uh, that we are looking at here now. If you're looking at dust concentration, the differences are even larger, but that's not quite fair because the different models use also different uh, size ranges. Um, so um, yeah, while if you're interested in uh, the dust effects, for example, for photovoltaics in Europe, uh, this is very, very nice and, 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 and good enough. <coughs> if you're interested in, if you're living closer to the uh, source region, um, you might get more worried about differences in different models. Um, we always ex uh, recommend using the median forecast, of, of course. Um, yeah, but if you are um, not necessarily only interested in the in the forecast, but also want to understand um, differences in if you if you if you have uh, changes in climate, um, for example, climate conditions, how does this change uh, dust emissions? You really want to get the right results for the right reasons. And um, we do see that there are still some discrepancies um, that we have here for the dust sources and dust emission computations, which can have something to do with the dust emission flux computations. It can have something to do that not all the dust surface property data that are needed for the dust emission modeling are available in sufficient uh, um, uh, accuracy, for example, soil crusting. Um, the um, grid resolution of the models may have some consequences. For example, you might have a mismatch between atmospheric, um, the, the model grid and uh, your um, um, topo topo topographic uh, or surface features. And of course, uh, the representation of dust causing wind system um, uh, might be too crude um, in order to get all the uh, details of the, of the wind systems that cause dust emission. So as uh, you see, there's still work to do on dust source modeling, and this is also one of the uh, key uh, areas um, where we made uh, progress in the uh, recent years at the Tropos Institute. Um, so, but then uh, picking up from the dust sources, we are also interested in the diff uh, different aspects of the dust transport, plus uh, the dust effects, where we are looking both uh, in the regional scale as well as the, the global scale. A lot of the work uh, that has been done in the recent years, um, particular on dust sources, has been done by Kerstin Chepanski, who used to work at Tropos and had a rather big group uh, at us. But as you see on the right hand side, um, she is now a former member of Tropos. So she is now a professor at the Free University of Berlin. So I won't really talk much about her work, and I think she might be a good speaker maybe for a different seminar where she can also represent the work she's doing now. <laughs> Sorry, Kerstin, <laughs> to uh, do, this, <laughs> do this for you. Uh, just here um, saying a few words uh, what, what uh, her group has been doing. I mean, she has uh, been looking at very different types of dust sources, not only desert sources, but um, for example, um, looking at uh, dust sources through to pyroconvective activities from agricultural sources, alluvial sources, and she also has uh, had a, um, a co-worker who has uh, done, Jamie Banks has done a, a, a pretty detailed look on the dust index uh, from a meteorstat, and now he's working on Central Asian dust emission. And of course, her own work on dust emissions is um, based on meteorstat data is rather well known. Um, I've uh, put together here some uh, nice uh, publications of her from the recent years. <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the um, slides will be uh, made available so you can just uh, check them out. Um, okay, so apart from the from the dust uh, source studies, of course, uh, as I was saying, we are looking at um, dust transport. And with, what we do is we have two different uh, model systems that we use. One is working on the regional scale, the Cosmo Muscat model, which is driven by um, weather forecast model, formerly a uh, Cosmo model, now it's the ICANN model. And um, on the other hand side, uh, if you're looking at um, global um, dust uh, distributions and dust impacts, we're using the ECAM-Hammots model, which will also be replaced by ICANN-HAM. 
Uh, so we have uh, we'll have done then a look on the dust events uh, on this, on, a, on a regional scale, which is well suited to um, regional case studies, and the uh, global studies are <coughs> really more into the global impact uh, studies. Um, one feature is that we have uh, the same emission parameterization in both models. Our dust emission scheme is originally based on the multi Korea at 97 scheme, which has then been modified, uh, including dry lake beds as preferential sources and the MSG-based source mass concarstein um, as a mask for the Saharan sources, including then also vegetation uh, phenology data. And as we speak, uh, the dust emission module is also updated with new uh, parameterizations <clears throat> from the uh, work by Kerstin. Um, as I said, it's not, it, it's not so ideal to have two completely separate um, uh, transport, uh, dust transport systems. Um, in the future, this will be unified by using the ICON model um, as, uh, as a meteorological driver, which is something where, uh, uh, which has now in Germany replaced both the COSMO model as a uh, weather forecast modeling system, as well as um, the ECA model for, for the climate modeling. And so we are lagging a little bit behind um, with implementing um, the aerosol, aerosol scheme into this model, but this is um, also work in progress. Um, where we then will be able to use one single model system to look at the different scales. The idea is um, with our um, um, dust modeling to um, take the, 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 uh, um, what we learned from um, dust emission modeling as new parameterization for the regional model where we then have uh, field studies and uh, observations in order to evaluate the validity of the uh, dust emission and that then going the step further to, to go to the global scale to adapt <clears throat> the ap appropriate emission parameterizations. Yes, um, and uh, now um, I want to show you some examples. And while I said uh, that I'm not going to really show um, uh, the work from, from, uh, from Kerstin's group so much, uh, uh, one exception is some recent results of, uh, for the agricultural dust. Um, Matthias Faust is a PhD student who works with uh, Kerstin, but he's currently still at the Tropos Institute. What he has done is to find a new parameterization for dust emissions from agricultural fields, taking into account uh, bare uh, soil fraction from satellite, um, turbulence uh, correction uh, in the boundary layer, and <clears throat> both including roughness uh, from the plant cover as well as from soil. Um, and what he's shown first was with, a, with this um, a, um, a trajectory ensemble modeling study, including um, some uh, turbulence scheme that if you have turbulent boundary conditions, if you get emissions, if you're lucky to have dry conditions uh, and plowing going on, it can, can be that the dust is distributed even in the um, a few kilometers high and that allows it to be transported a few uh, hundred kilometers. So it's not only a local phenomenon, really just depending on the weather conditions. And um, one thing that he's also done is to look, uh, as you see here on the right hand side, he has uh, implemented uh, his emission scheme in the, in the regional COSMO model and could capture a dust event from agricultural fields in uh, Poland, um, where at the same time as uh, the fields were bare and just uh, recently plowed, uh, strong winds occurred. Um, this was uh, picked up um, not only by the model, but uh, it could also be seen in the MODIS uh, data. It's from April 2019, and you can also compare with the PM10 data. Um, so there is indeed um, the possibility to capture these, these type of effect with this uh, parameterization. Of course, this is only uh, so far uh, one uh, case study, um, but uh, this is kind of an, <clears throat> an interesting a thing that we can include now in the, in the larger scale modeling as well. This was uh, based on a, on a Leibniz funded uh, project, uh, uh, which uh, as, as I mentioned, Kerstin is a PI on. Okay, but uh, speaking of uh, model validation, let me go back to a further uh, um, former case study. I mean, we have started uh, out with um, Saharan dust modeling for the different uh, field experiments and one 
one of the things that we found was that it's especially useful to use um, the uh, LIDAR uh, measurements uh, that our uh, ground-based remote sensing uh, group is providing. And uh, uh, during the moon, Matthias Tesche, who was then working at Tropos in the LIDAR group, uh, found this uh, possibility to separate uh, dust and smoke layers, which we could use for evaluating uh, the dust and smoke um, model results for the SAMUM2 campaign, which dealt with uh, dust transport um, off the coast of um, Sahara uh, directed at the Cap Verde Islands. And on the right hand side, um, you can see um, with the dotted lines as the LIDAR measurements and the uh, uh, straight and uh, dashed lines are model results for smoke in blue and for dust in yellow. For uh, using that interactive and non-interactive dust, one of the things is that the interactive dust uh, uh, and smoke leads to a kind of a self-lifting of the of the plume. Uh, we can uh, evaluate the, the um, layering of the of the dust. The model isn't doing that great with the layering, uh, but also this comparison with the profile data can help us evaluate. <clears throat> The height of the dust layer, which is important, first of all, um, which uh, layer it is for the transport direction of the dust, and on the other hand, also the dust effects would be depending on the on the height, um, relative um, height, for example, compared to other aerosol layers uh, and compared to the cloud layer. So um, profile comparisons are super useful, and that's why we have our light. We are glad to have our lidar group, which helps us to evaluate our dust. Okay, from that, um, where we, uh, one example from the global studies that we are doing, where we see where the location of the dust layer might play a role. So these are, I'm, I'm showing results uh, in the next slide from the ECAM uh, HUM global model. Um, one of the things that we are interested in is, in, is the uh, global radiative effect of the, of the dust and um, not only the direct radiative effect, but also the semi-direct effect or the adjustment in the atmosphere due to the dust forcing. Uh, on the right hand side, there's a, um, a figure that I took from a paper from Di Biagio et al. from uh, 2020 GL, uh, GL paper, um, where it is shown that if you look at this um, blue line, which represents the global average of top of the atmosphere dust radiative forcing. In the recent years, estimates uh, that showed uh, that uh, we have um, rather more coarse mode aerosol in the or coarse mode dust in the atmosphere, which also has. Um, 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 positive uh, thermal effect, long wave uh, forcing, that all this cancellation between um, short wave and long wave and uh, uh, darker uh, uh, positive forcing over bright deserts and negative forcing over, over oceans leaves us with a, with a global average uh, radiative forcing near zero, which is not so impressive because it looks like, uh, yeah, well, it's not even worth mentioning in the IPCC report, which it wasn't actually. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, the dust isn't going anywhere. It's a lot of it's there. So it, it does have an effect in the atmosphere, even so regionally on one hand and also for adjustments. And that's something that we are um, very interested in. And let me show one, one example from a run uh, where we try to look at the separate effects from dust and uh, black carbon in this case for um, an area for, the, for, uh, for Central Asia. Here is the meridional uh, cross section from equator to 60 degree north the, in Central Asia, it's uh, 67 degree east. You see a heating rate differences um, with dust um, uh, minus uh, no dust. And this is, uh, you, you see the dust going up uh, very high. The positive forcing is not as great as with the, with the uh, black carbon. But when we, when we are interested, many people are interested in uh, the effects of the black carbon aerosol. On the right hand side, there is a temperature effect due to black carbon. Uh, in the model, which you see is as even some positive effect here in, in Central Asia. But if you also implement the dust, if you, if you sort of add the dust on top of the, of the black carbon aerosol, you see a dampening of the effect, which is, um, I mean, the easiest way to explain it is, is just basically the shadowing effect of the dust uh, that the black carbon is not seen as much. So in this case, um, it is quite uh, crucial to know which uh, um, is if there is dust in the atmosphere, is it really laying above, like a cloud, laying above the other aerosol layers? Um, and as we have seen in a few minutes, um, this is exactly something where our um, uh, remote sensing department is useful because they have a, a station, a lidar station in Tajikistan in Jambé, 
or where they can uh, show us exactly where the dust layer is located. And it was actually also motivating why we actually looked there. Okay. Now, with this excursion to the global modeling, let's go back to regional case studies. Uh, if you're looking at other impacts, one thing we have also been done is uh, looking at the impact of dust on cloud development. And here is one case study. Uh, there are few cases. I mean, we have several times in the year we have dust outbreaks over, um, over Europe, but only very rare that uh, we have these kind of super strong events. Uh, 2014 was one of those cases um, where we had really high dust optical thickness in Central Europe, and that was accompanied by a thick, uh, high cloud, uh, cirrus cloud layer that nobody had expected before. Um, and exactly the same conditions we found, for example, uh, this spring in March, a very similar case. And last year in February, there was also a similar case like this. Um, if you look in the right hand side, there is a sort of a sketch. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, it's, you see the dust index from the Meteosat uh, second generation uh, satellite. What you see is that, uh, well, you probably don't really see it, but um, uh, what Michael Vega, who has uh, who's done this study, has seen is that um, this dust uplift was um, in front of a frontal, of a code front. And, um, the, and at the same time, there was a lot of convective activities going on. Um, uh, which was uh, the, so the dust was was uh, reproduced in the near the Algerian Moroccan border and then transported straight to Europe. Now we found that this was a really neat case in order to look at the role of dust on the cloud development because yeah, there were so many clouds and uh, we, the weather forecast model didn't see them so there must have been something like uh, this um, uh, ice formation enhancement. Uh, luckily, exactly at that time, there was an aircraft field campaign, um, uh, actually quite unrelated, but they were looking at uh, serious properties. It's an ML serious campaign from the DLR, uh, described in Vogue et al. And they could take uh, measurements, uh, not only of cloud properties, but also of aerosol properties. So we could use that for model evaluation. And I mean, even if it doesn't really look that great, but in the, in the heights where, where the cloud uh, was forming, um, the agreement was really not so bad between model and those kind of observations. And on the right hand side, what is shown is um, the MSG derived brightness temperatures uh, indicating cloud cover. Uh, model results of the same uh, when we didn't include the dust and then including the dust from our model results with uh, in including the role of the ice nucleation and uh, the radiation using the ciphered Behang two moment scheme in the model with an ice uh, nucleation parameterization by Ulrich et al. <clears throat> from 2017 from the, the Kit Institute. What we see is that in fact um, uh, there's much too little clouds uh, um, compared to the observations. If you don't include dust, it gets a bit better if you include the dust, but it's still much too low and similar with the precipitation. All the dots are observations by the German Weather Service and the, the areas are the model results. Uh, the precipitation looks a bit better if we include the dust effects, uh, but it's still uh, overestimating the precipitation in some areas. And the interesting thing is that has been found by Michael Vega, who's published this work. Uh, used to, um, um, it was actually his master's thesis. Uh, it's quite amazing work. Um, so um, that in fact, the direct effect of this semi-direct effect by, by um, suppressing convection due to the radiative effect of the dust had a bigger impact than the ice nucleation. Um, so everybody was sad that um, they, when they found out uh, what was the problem in the model, there was too little humidity transported uh, to, towards Central Europe um, due to this, uh, uh, during this um, um, event. Um, so if there's no humidity, there, it also cannot form clouds. However, uh, since this year's event looked really quite similar and there was also in the model, um, it appears that the, they underestimate humidity. Um, this is actually a quite interesting case because um, there could be a problem from the, using the parameterized convection in the weather forecast model that we use to drive the transport model. And convection parameterization is indeed a, a, a difficult uh, problem in these cases, not only for the dust transport, but we have known this for a long time, uh, dust um, um, con uh, uh, convection parameterization for uh, wet convective events is also a problem if you want to drive dust emissions that might be related to wet convective events. Uh, this is an 
result, a very nice result. It's, it's quite aged because it's from the first Samoom experiment, um, but it is really a perfect example of this. Um, there was, um, during the Samoom experiment in 2006, there was this kind of event uh, due to um, a graphically induced uh, density current um, that has been observed directly. Peter Knippertz um, uh, was, um, uh, who is then still working at, in mines. Um, oh, he described this very uh, nicely in his papers. Uh, and if you wanted to, to reproduce this in the model, we found that uh, whichever we, we tried to do, we only got this right if we use a convection resolving uh, model scale uh, using about three kilometers as, as a grid resolution. Otherwise, there was no chance to capture this type of uh, dust emission. So in, in 2006 or eight, whenever we, 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 we published this, well, um, this was, we were like, yeah, well, I mean, um, in order to improve uh, the dust, imp uh, this type of dust em emission modeling, we really would like to have a convective resolving modeling. However, um, there's no chance, by then it was really no chance uh, to, to do this for larger scales and for longer time scales. Um, nevertheless, many years later now, um, the uh, uh, computing architectures have so much improved and also model development has improved and now there is actually the chance to do this, uh, and this is what we hope um, to be able to achieve at some point with the ICANN model. The ICANN model is um, a developed uh, um, in combination from the, from the uh, German Weather Service and the MPI for meteorology. Um, it has a, a multi grid approach uh, which allows uh, nesting with resolution uh, uh, down to a few hundred meters for the grid. Uh, it actually already com contains uh, um, uh, aerosol chemistry models, the ART module. Uh, the ICANN ART is also part of the uh, dust forecast uh, from the SDS was, uh, um, results. However, what we are planning to do is also to implement our own developments. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, of course, uh, we can also make use of the existing traces structures. So this is a way forward that we want to do. Um, there has already been an implementation of the HUM model with the ICANN. On the right hand side, you see in comparison with Aeronet data, it's not doing all that bad. Yes. So this is um, model development and pro progress. And this is something where we look towards in the future. OK, but um, I want to leave now uh, the modeling part. As I've said, um, there has been a lot of uh, contributions also from, from, from other uh, departments at Tropos. And they were so friendly to provide me with uh, some of, her, of their slides. Um, so you get an overview on whichever data are also available um, that might be particularly also of interest for the dust modeling community. And one of the more uh, uh, already famous data, but I think uh, that still deserves a lot of attention, is uh, the data that uh, we get from our ground-based uh, remote uh, sensing uh, department. Um, and I want to show some results from the from the poly uh, net um, um, <clears throat> stations, which are um, uh, polarization uh, uh, lidar instrumentation. <clears throat> the person to contact um, if they, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm not the person to talk, uh, to tell you much about technical questions, but. Holger Bars is, so he should be somewhere around in the audience. Uh, so he might be able to answer some more technical questions, but nevertheless, um, um, I can uh, uh, show you some of the possibilities there. The, the LiDAR measurements aren't the only uh, uh, instruments that the groups are, are um, uh, operating. They also have um, 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 uh, cloud um, um, radars, they, they, they have, um, uh, wind lighter, so a full seat of uh, instruments to, to, to look at the uh, atmospheric uh, column from different angles. Nevertheless, for us, it's, I think, uh, the polyliners that are the interesting instruments. So here I got a map from them uh, where they have um, basically all, all done this, uh, all their studies. The stars indicate uh, stations that, uh, to a big part, uh, provide continuous uh, measurements of um, aerosol profiles but also their indication of uh, field uh, experiments. And one thing that they're doing is also to measure during uh, research uh, as a transect, particularly with the polar stern during their race from Arctic and Antarctic and back. Um, 
So what is PolyNet? Um, it is a troppos led network of uh, polyliders, uh, which uh, contains uh, automatic multi wavelengths Raman polarization liders. So they get a lot of data where they can much get much more than just a backscatter profiles um, <clears throat> and much more information about the actual aerosol properties that they see. It's a system, uh, they, they operate more than 15 systems with several international partners. So they're not operating everything, but they collect them on their website. Um, and important is that they have a homogenized and centralized automated data analysis and that for model is, is this very, very nice. So that is really uh, homogeneous data that, that we can get and they get them nearly real time. And on the right hand side, you see the website. So you have to go to uh, poly.tropos.de and then you find all these different uh, stations which you can click on and you see uh, pretty much up to date uh, profiles, but you can also go back with the calendars to see previous events. So this is an example of one event from the Saharan dust uh, and um, event in, that has been picked up in uh, Leipzig from February last year. With an overlying service uh, layer here in green, the dust layer is indicated here in black. So this is uh, by continuously measure, measure, measuring, they just uh, can pick up um, interesting features and you can just go and back if you find something and look at your, at your, uh, <clears throat> at your um, 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 aerosol properties. These are typical uh, profiles um, that they extract. So not a backscatter coefficient, but also depolarization ratio, extinction coefficient from the Raman spectrum, um, being able to compute lighter ratio, and they also get information on uh, relative humidity. So all uh, useful things. These are data from Mindelo. And this is a sketch from uh, Athena Fruzzi, uh, which she prepared for her PhD thesis, where a lot of um, data that they found were uh, sorted according to linear depolarization ratio and the LIDAR ratio. And with the help of these clustering, they can make separation between uh, different aerosol types. And for us, most interesting is here the cluster that indicates uh, the presence of mineral dust, which has a high depolarization ratio. And uh, this comes from the non sphericity of the dust particles. This allows a typing of the aerosol, and this typing can also be done um, automatically. So here are some data from uh, Lima Sol that they provided, and also uh, automatic uh, layer uh, recognition is, is possible here for, for um, time series in uh, Haifa in Israel, where they have another station. So, um, and here there's uh, another view on the, on the website, which indicates all the different data that you can get. And most importantly, the name um, uh, of the person you can contact if for any question or if you'd like to have different types of access to the data. That's Holger Bass, Bass at Tropos.de. And I'm sure he's also going to be happy to answer any questions that arise. Um, I want just to show some um, more examples on this. Um, here in uh, Dushanbe, I was already mentioning in Tajikistan, they have a station um, which is, uh, had, was on a break for some time now, but now it's uh, being uh, up again. And they have, for example, a long time series here from 15, 2015 to 2016, um, uh, showing um, significant aerosol layers in, in uh, Tajikistan. For dust modeling, I must say it's a super difficult but super interesting uh, region because uh, for the topographic features they have, the modeling is not really easy. On the other hand, um, there is um, not much information on dust, but uh, given that it's a hotspot of climate change, uh, it's also a place where dust sources um, might change drastically also in the next years. One interesting thing that they saw uh, very exciting is they find uh, dust layers up to 10 kilometer height or higher. So you have really high elevated dust layers uh, and dust above uh, uh, pollution aerosol there is really quite common occurrence in particular in the early summer. So a lot of data um, that, that uh, would be useful for Central Asian uh, dust studies. Uh, one of the examples that they show here is a very dense uh, dust event. Um, that occurred in 2015. Uh, optical thickness of that was about 0.5. And with back trajectory studies, they found that the biggest um, dust plume come from the Iran region. 
but it, it, there's layers above uh, the top you don't even see from Middle East and Sahara. So uh, you get um, signals from long range uh, transported dust. So you would need at least hemispherical scale dust modeling to capture all these um, dust information. From going to the other side uh, from the, of the dust belt, um, there has been um, another example, a cruise from the, with the meteor settle, vessel where they characterized um, the Saharan air layer. They actually went from um, a, 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 a con counter to the dust from um, west to east, but nevertheless they could uh, characterize the typical uh, parts of the, of the uh, dust profiles. Um, big dust layer close to the coast of Africa. It's kind of getting um, eroded away uh, from uh, turbulence from the marine boundary layer and sinking cell. Um, near the Caribbean. And um, from these, these profiles were used then to evaluate uh, for, for evaluation of different um, forecast modeling, not as a forecast, but as a hindcast. Uh, as you see here on the, on the right hand side was published by Albert Ansmann in uh, 2017. Um, you do see that um, the models are doing okay in the, in, the, in the overall, but there is really some differences in the vertical layering. And this type of information can be nicely used um, to correct these layers. And there's even um, the chance, not with a ship crews, but with a, uh, with a fixed stations that are continuously measuring um, to, uh, to make use of this as an input for um, assimilation in operational models. And as you've seen, the dust signal is very clear from, from this uh, typing. So it should, uh, Holger said, uh, told me that it should even be possible to really pull out very quickly um, the, the, the dust information <clears throat> from, from the LIDAR signals uh, to make uh, automatically, so to make it available as input uh, for, uh, for dust assimilation. Okay, um, and I guess very quickly go through this. This is um, a new um, uh, developments at the um, uh, Sao Vincente at, at Cap Verde. Uh, there have been measurements for quite some time, but it's, it's really now built up uh, with um, many more instrumentations, which is a part uh, of the, will be part of the ACTRIS um, uh, European infrastructure. Um, which is something that I don't really have time to talk about today, but uh, um, Topos is also leading the German um, a part of the, of the um, uh, actress uh, uh, German initiative. Um, yeah, and so that will enable really this kind of long-term uh, observations of the development of the Saharan air layer at uh, Cap Verde as done here for the example of the year 2021. There you can see that this is, this is a summer dust layer with the pure dust and the, the winter with the more mixed uh, dust and uh, smoke layers. Um, and I just, um, so this is just, just briefly show, um, I'm sure we can talk for many hours uh, on, on their results, but that's something that they probably should present themselves at uh, some point. Okay, um, this was, uh, um, I ended with a cup birdie because this is where I'm gonna say some words on the uh, Dust Risk project. Uh, with, five five yeah? minutes, five yeah. minutes. Okay, um, I, I speed up even more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, there's a project from our chemistry department, which is based on the uh, Cup Verdean Islands. What they are doing is uh, to look at the health impact of the dust. I mean, you know that in the Cap Verde Islands, uh, there's regular um, dust events, and um, uh, there's also uh, the question if uh, to, to, to which extent this, this um, uh, can, may affect local health. And so, Wadinga, uh, former at Tropos the if you have questions, um, got funding from the Leibniz Society to have a network project to look at how um, dust and microbes interact and how. Uh, the um, um, possible to toxins um, associated with dust may impact on, uh, on the health. So he is also um, collaborating with um, local uh, uh, health um, facilities uh, to do this. I just uh, put up everything here just briefly. Uh, so it's, it's a big um, a network uh, project with field studies. Uh, they're looking at variation of dust parameterizations. They're trying to characterize whatever they find on top of the dust. Um, there's modeling in order to 
um, get information on the dust uh, sourcing. And uh, there's also um, yeah, um, investigations on the health effects of this. So um, that's something which um, I, I cannot also tell you very much more about right now, because this is ongoing work. Um, uh, which is uh, Vadinga Fomba again, is, would be the person to, to talk to what's, what's going on. Um, they just completed, a six, uh, just completed a few months ago a six week measurement campaign. And what Vadinga told me is uh, that they did find indication of uh, some microbes that uh, would be indicate both a local origin, but also uh, indications for um, uh, source regions. Um, but again, just. Um, keep your attention uh, posted here because um, that might be quite some interesting results coming up. So, and finally, I also want to, 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 to talk a little bit, uh, just a few minutes on the ice nucleation uh, project that uh, they've, they're doing based on lab studies and also on field experiments. And I got some information from Heike Wex, Wex at Tropos DE who is basically the, the expert on this kind of lab studies of ice nucleating properties of dust and other ice nucleating particles. In the Leibniz aerosol cloud interaction simulator, many samples, including dust, were, were investigated and there's plenty of publications came out on that. And they all go into some kind of uh, these kind of curves, uh, whoever is um, dealing with uh, dust, uh, with ice nucleation particles now sees uh, these are um, ice nucleating uh, particle um, concentrations, depending on uh, temperatures. And you see that uh, if, you, if you're looking at uh, dust particles, safe um, cause or enhanced freezing. Uh, by heterogeneous processes like immersion freezing or deposition freezing at temperatures um, maximum uh, 15 degree or colder, like more like 20 degree minus, 25 degree minus. Uh, I mean, starting 40 degree minus, you have um, homogeneous freezing, but above that, um, there's some heterogeneous uh, initiator. If you have uh, freezing at higher temperatures, that is a hint for uh, biogenic particles that might freeze in temperatures as high as a minus eight degree. What they found is if they, um, they, they, they treated dust particles in different ways, and one thing they found is that you just, uh, if you freeze uh, dust that has been treated with just one, very little, one molecule or so of um, 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 uh, biogenic origin, it, it might already change the freezing behavior towards um, biogenic materials. It was an, a paper by Augustine Bauditz from the Cloud Group. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is um, also something which will then be interesting what they find in uh, the Cap Verdean Islands, what's sitting on top of the dust. Uh, and one thing uh, I want to finally mention from them, it's um, so this will be my, my last slide. Um, this is um, um, they've just uh, finishing analysis of a two-year measurement campaign where they sampled um, uh, INP samples and analyzed them in freezing arrays in the, in the lab. Um, of course, they did it in, in Greenland. This is not necessarily uh, a lot of dust there. So what they find in the summer is indications of biogenic material uh, causing the freezing. While well, in the winter months, um, the curves is sort of a background which might include some dust or some, some, some marine material. Um, <clears throat> so it's not necessarily dust related, but nevertheless, uh, really quite, quite uh, neat. Because this I find if they put all the data together and this, I mean, there have been time series of, of INP, but this is really a very long and very complete time series. Um, that they find this kind of type of uh, parameterization, which is only depending on on temperatures with some uh, um, fitting parameters, uh, which is not even needing some kind of an aerosol concentration as an input. So this is kind of interesting. Um, we'll see if they find something like that also for different parts of the world. Yes, and then this leaves me with my uh, final slide, uh, just for a summary. Um, so you see that uh, dust research is a central uh, research topic at the Tropos Institute. For the modeling, um, we focus on um, uh, source properties and also on meteorology. 
together with uh, looking at effects on radiation dynamics and ice formation. Um, there's lab studies um, complementing our research, or basically they say <laughs> we complement theirs, depending on the, <laughs> on the perspective. A lot of field studies go on with a special emphasis on uh, the ground-based uh, remote sensing uh, group that do a lot of, um, of uh, measurements that will be useful for analyzing uh, dust and whatever goes on with uh, dust and uh, cloud interactions. And um, what is particularly useful is uh, to know for dust models is that there are these polynet sites that can give you a lot of uh, information um, just um, freely available that you can use for dust model evaluation. And one of the big advantages that we have, of, uh, of course, at Tropos is that we have uh, possibilities of uh, close uh, collaboration between the modeling and uh, measurement groups. Yeah. Okay, that was it. And I thank you for your attention. I hope I'll be able to answer some of the questions at least. <coughs> um, yeah, I think that you cannot listen, but I'm sure that the people is doing, yeah, plan it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ina, for your nice talk and the huge overview that you did in 45 minutes. It's amazing, all the activities that are running now in Tropos. Really, are you covering everything, I will say. Then uh, I'm sure that uh, the participants also enjoyed the talk of Ina. And now we will start with the round of questions that uh, Estelios is also here. He's, he's not showing his face, but we have another chair that is Estelios Hatatis that as usual is chairing the session. He's an expert in solar radiation observations and is based in Davos in Switzerland. He's a little bit shy because he's not opening the camera, but he's here. And uh, I will answer the first question that is a little bit gener generic. Um, basically, Amir Nikfal is asking you if the topographical approach for uh, identifying dust sources developed by Paul Gino is still valid in the current dust atmospheric models. Um, well, um, yeah, I, everybody is, 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 is treating that a bit different and people hope a little bit uh, to, to, to get some, some more, more, more general um, application for it. But yeah, we, we're still, use, I mean, we are still using it as not, not quite his, but, but very similar. I mean, our, our uh, to, to topographic depressions uh, dilate is very similar from uh, to Paul Genou's approach because this is a, a very practical approach that gives you um, very good results for, for um, where the dust is actually found and uh, deflated. It doesn't give you the full picture, of course, uh, because um, you do have um, things like uh, crusting or, or roughness elements that might not be completely ex be explained. Uh, by this, and uh, there's uh, there's groups that that um, can can basically live without it. But I, I still recommend uh, if you have trouble matching uh, these these kind of um, uh, high dust emissions from from uh, topographic de depressions to use this approach. One has to say, of course, it's not entirely only the emission, but nevertheless, it could also be a sort of where where um, dust um, accumulates and then at some point gets blown away if, uh, if you have uh, uh, the, the appropriate wind systems. Nevertheless, um, it might be good enough, for example, for, for dust forecasting. I mean, this is um, then it doesn't really matter exactly at which part of your of your grid cell the dust is really deflated. Um, you know that it's accumulating there and then uh, you just use that as a dust source. So I think it's still useful. I agree with you. Then we have another question, Santiago, if you want to take care. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, this is a question from Franco Marenko. He's, he's wondering on the data sets available to constrain uh, modeling, model runs. Uh, you know, it's fairly standard now to use uh, satellite data uh, and Aeronet uh, observations to constrain modeling. So he's wondering what what is what is your wish list of or what is the the next data set that you would add to assimilations to and which which data set will have the 
the best, uh, the most impact on uncertainties? Yeah, um, Aeronet, of course, is, uh, we already mentioned that it's been used by everybody and this is a fantastic data set, uh, which is freely available and gives you a lot of great information in many, many places. Um, yeah, and I mean, you can always sort of say, yeah, there's uncertainty, but uh, no, it's, it's really the best. A satellite, everybody knows, a satellite is super useful, but it has, of course, uncertainties. Yeah, but I, what I would say is really these kind of, of, of LiDAR networks, um, in particular, where I have now really to advertise uh, what the people at my institute are doing, um, not my department, so I can't I can really advertise, um, because what they are doing, I mean, this is uh, dust profiling. Um, it, dust profiling has been around for, for quite some time, but what they are doing is they're extracting a lot of different information, including the typing of different aerosol types, this uh, at different places of the world, uh, very useful. I mean, they have several stations that might be useful for Saharan dust and, and European modeling, uh, like in, in Evora, in, in, um, uh, in, in, in Greece, in Cyprus, in Leipzig, that can be, be used. And they're really um, trying to go towards uh, real time uh, provision of this automatic retrievals or automatic analysis that they are planning to do. I think one of the thing, questions that's still open would be how to transfer those data quickly, but I'm sure you can talk to them and um, trying to, to, to get the best out of that. What Holger was telling me that there is already with a CAMS uh, model that they have already started to, to, to look into that, um, to, to, to do assimilation for the CAMS model, but I don't think uh, that has progressed so far a lot, but um, um, uh, I, I would, for a simulation, very much recommend it because, um, I mean, it's all good and nice uh, to get the, the, the distribution right. Of course, it's very crucial, but it's also very important to get the elevation right because you want to have the dust in the correct layer so that you know where it's going next. So the different air masses will be transported in a different way. Yeah. So that would be my next, the next step. And I mean, talk to them, Holger will be happy to assist. <laughs> Sorry, Holger. <laughs> okay. Also, I, I will add something in this discussion because is you are not mentioned the surface concentration in sources. Yes, this is one of the things that if I have to do a wish list, I will have I would love to have surface concentration on in Africa and Middle East. This will be the best, right? Yeah, that is true. Um, as a, as I mentioned that before, what, what uh, Matthias Faust was doing, I mean, he was looking at PM10 data in Europe, which are freely available and everywhere, but for Africa, yeah, to get a better network. Uh, one, one thing that is usually available is visibility data from air airports. Um, they are also kind of useful. Uh, I think people have tried to use them quite a bit. Um, so I wouldn't discard them. I just have to get a good way to, to, to implement them in, 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 your, in your assimilation schemes. But yeah, I mean, as, 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 as you have seen in the beginning, I mean, near the source, you, you still have quite some spread. And this is due to um, not that the models are stupid, but it's due to them not being that well constrained near, near the sources. Satellites are, are great, but you know about the uncertainties over land. Do, do you have do you have a do you see value in using seelometer data? Yes, yes. To complement lidars. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, they have they are. Um, in, in, I know that there's a big, big uh, seelometer uh, network in, in in Germany, and I'm sure it's elsewhere as well. Uh, in Germany, it's 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 um, um, sort of organized by the uh, German Weather Service, and they always uh, they would be happy to share those data, particularly for data assimilation. We ourselves, I must admit, haven't really used it much. Um, as I said, we are not in the in the forecast business. Um, they do have; they are very simple, but they can tell you uh, basically where the layer is sitting, and you do have then the individual um, uh, Polynet liner stations to sort of um calibrate uh, what the information but at least it gives you some information where the stuff is and where it isn't so um i should imagine that is really useful data for for forecasting for for assimilation for for model evaluation there's there's some use but again uh, for the quantification we would need additional uh, information because um, i mean they, they can tell you is it dust or is it something else or um, um these things
Any more questions? No, just, just, just to end the seminar, can I share the dust event of the day? <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Let me put it in the chat. If I, if I find you you can share your screen if you want. You, you are allowed to. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I just put it. Uh, okay. Well, now I need to pull it, but the, the chat is not showing. There. Maybe you can I share the screen. Yeah, I just put it. There is a the, question uh, in the in the chat uh, in the chat box. Uh, it's related about operational dust focus systems that includes a simulation of dust observations. And Amir Nick Fall is asking, uh, what are what kind of measurements uh, are are considered in these simulations of dust? Given that we are not doing that, I, I can't really say, but I think they only assimilate MODIS data right now, It's right? totally AOD, yeah. As far as I know, uh, most of the systems that includes uh, the assimilation is total aerosol optical depth from MODIS or IDONET, maybe some BEERS or PMAP, but uh, it's not dust, let's say, but there are some research going to that direction to assimilate uh, Aerosol speciation. Okay, then at the moment the answer will be not pure dust, is assimilating aerosol, bulk aerosol. Yeah, Santiago, go ahead. <laughs> That's the last question in the in the seminar. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, there are no questions. Okay. Yeah, it's done. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> yeah, you can show the event of the day. Oh, uh, well, I, I just put, put it on the, uh, okay, let me show you my, my Twitter feed uh, here. How do you share here? It should, it should be sharing now, okay. So this is a, a dust event. Oh, it's in, it's in Spanish, don't worry. But it's just, I think the picture is pretty obvious. Uh, it's, a, it's a dust event this morning in central Argentina. It's, uh, as you can see, it's almost 3,000 kilometers wide. It's made of three components. Uh, you have dust here, which is uh, what we call anthropogenic dust. This is coming from the agricultural area here. Also, you have smoke that is under the clouds. There are big fires right here. This is Buenos Aires. The fires are right here. And then you have this huge cloud here, which is a mixture of smoke from fires on the day before and dust that is coming all the way from northern Patagonia. This was a dust event from yesterday, yesterday night, and it's already by here. But altogether, they mixed and there. And what is unusual about this is uh, in this, in this part of the world, usually you have polar fronts coming in. This is not a polar front. This is just a, a high pressure center in the Pacific that is just moving all this. So anyways, just to, to highlight you know, some dust from different parts of the world. Maybe, maybe you can consider today, 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 you know. Yeah. <laughs> For future the, the assessment of the- Oh yeah, no, just to-, just to just to illustrate, there is too much work to be done. That, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. yeah, and always new work. <laughs> mm. Then uh, with it, it's 404. I want to thanks again, Ina, for this nice talk. And uh, yeah, for really review all the things that are ongoing in the community, in your institute in particular. Thanks a lot to the my co-chairs today, Slodovan and Santiago and Estelios. You see, all, all of us, we start with a simulator or, or name, Slodovan, Santiago and Sara, and Estelios. <laughs> That's a curiosity. And just, yeah. and just a reminder, after a few days, this webinar, the recording and the slides will be available in the das.imet.es resources section. Then no worries. Everything is public. You will be access to all the webinars. Even the past webinars are available. Then the INAS one will be available next week. And the speaker that we will have in November will be announced in the next days. It will be 16 November, the date. 
but um, we need to confirm the final speaker because um, we are discussing about some issues with the dates. Then please follow us through Twitter, through newsletter, and also you can follow Santiago or me for the advertisement of these webinars. And with it, just I want to tell you have a nice evening and afternoon and hope to see you in one month, more or less. Bye. Bye. Thank you.